shoot. Sorry. Um, yeah. 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 This is perfect. Perfect. Yeah. <coughs> well, it's Daisy in the picture. Yes, that's Daisy. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> yeah. So sorry. Uh, so mm. it's self. Yeah. Yeah. Just like this. Yeah. Um. What I, what I want to talk about is in, in, to do with the mind and the brain. It really, really covers three separate topics. And what I want to try and get across is that people's view of the mind is too restricted. It, it needs to, well, we need to change our mind about yeah. what our, the mind is. Yeah. And the three topics are, first of all, I want to talk about the evolution of the human brain yeah. and what makes the human brain different from other brains yeah. and what difference this makes to humanity as a whole. Yeah. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about what's involved. The main conclusion from that is that our brain, the cerebral cortex, which is the unique part of our brain, is largely to do with knowing about the world. This is a very old view, more than, more than 80 years old really. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's one that's coming into its own now. Mm. And I want to discuss briefly what that involves, how, how the brain finds out about the world yeah. and so on. And then thirdly, I want to discuss what, what all this implies about our minds, about, and that, that's where I come to the conclusion that we have to change, we have to enlarge our view of what the mind is a little bit. So let me start on the first topic, which is really about the human brain. And I think everyone knows that we have a very big brain. It's not actually bigger than, for example, an elephant's brain or a, a about the same size as an elephant brain. Uh, and it's not as big as a, a whale's brain, for example. Yeah. But in, in relation to the size of our bodies, it is, it's bigger than any other animal. Yeah. And for example, it's about three times the size of our nearly, nearest primate <coughs> relative, mm. chimpanzees. Mm. So of course part of that is a, is a kind of for by the fact that we are actually bigger than they are. Yeah. Now the interesting thing about the uh, about this is that it's a very recent enlargement, uh, roughly five million years since yeah. we separated from chimpanzees, yeah. uh, and for a, a, a very big change in to take place over that length of time uh, tells us something important because. Uh, you can't get rap rapid evolutionary change mm. without there also being a lot of evolutionary, a lot of genetic variation mm. in the in the in what makes us different. So the there must be um, genetic factors influencing our brain, mm. and they, these must have been influencing it for the last five million years at least to account for this very rapid evolution. So that. This makes us look at the brain rather differently if it's the product of fairly recent evolution. Yeah. Uh, it means, in fact, that some of the things we know about the world uh, are probably to do with genetic learning, rather natural learning by actual experience, mm. that the, 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 this bit of our brain may, may in fact specialize in being able to evolve rather than just to acquire knowledge in the usual way, through our senses and so on. Something worth bearing in mind about the human brain. Um, and there are other examples of um, evolution being rapid. For example, uh, in the domestication of animals, uh, the effect of human selection can have a big effect on, on the um, genetic structure of the species, so that a wild cat is a very different beast from a domestic cat. Yeah. And that, that's been produced by the fact that um, domestic cats have been selected by, partially selected by humans. So I think that one of the ideas that's rather intriguing is that we should regard the human brain as determined to a large extent by self-domestication, that, that our social lives have a big effect in determining how the brain has evolved. Mm. Then 
The big question, of course, is we've got a different brain from other animals, from particularly from our ne nearest relatives, the chimpanzees. What is it? What? What have we been selected for? What does this? What does our bigger brain enable us to do that we couldn't do otherwise? Mm. And that's where the thing I mentioned just previously, the, the I suppose generally accepted view is that it's it gives us greater knowledge of the world. This is why we're different from reptiles, yes. and it, this has probably been uh, the what the cerebral cortex does for the, those who own one uh, throughout evolution uh, is to acquire knowledge of the world. But uh, when one talks about knowledge, one usually thinks of sort of physical knowledge, you know, for example, that, uh, the existence of gravity, that if you let something go, it'll drop. This is something we all know about the world, and of course our, uh, a large part of our physical form depends upon uh, being adapted to the constant effect of evolution. Um, but there is another very important aspect of knowledge of the world until recently has tended to be overlooked, namely that a large part of this knowledge concerns social knowledge, mm. uh, knowledge of other people. So that I think where we have to look for the advantages of a, a, an evolved brain is largely in our ability to uh, observe and react to the social world we're, we're living in. And I want, I'm going to come back to that, so this is a point about the, about the brain that we ought to remember, so to speak. Yeah. Now that's, a, that's a, more or less what I had to say about the, the first point. Are, are there any things I should explain more? Um, so you talked about the enlargement of the human brain, yes. and um, you then stressed the importance of social factors. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you think these two are related, and what do you think of the relation between uh, the social factors and uh, some process which are analogous to human selection, like the domestic animals? Does, does are there any analogies between these two social relations and human selection? I mean, yeah. Well, yes. Um, I mean, we, when we domesticated dogs and, and, yeah. and cats. Uh, we, we threw out the ones that didn't conform to our, w w the ones that didn't behave socially as, as we wanted. If they were too aggressive yeah. or if they um, uh, had habits which we didn't like, so to speak, we could not breed from them and select only from the ones which, which we liked. Yeah. And that's what we do to each other, of course. That's you right, know, yeah. so that there's a, uh, the humans are themselves uh, domesticated by other humans. Yeah, of course, this happens in other species too, to some extent, I've yeah, no doubt. Yeah. But I think it must have happened much more in humans than in other species. Mm -hmm. And this, as we know from the really remarkably rapid change that domestication can bring about, yeah. um, that this is that, that a selective force of this kind can be extremely effective in changing what are after all mental a attributes yeah. of aggressiveness and things like that. So that the, the properties of the human mind must have been evolved under social pressure. After all, uh, the, uh, your social skills, your social knowledge mm -hmm. controls how much you eat, uh, how much sex you have, yeah. how, much, um, how many children you have, mm -hmm. how well your children are looked after. It has yeah. it's enormously uh, effective mm -hmm. factor in, in how well a, a particular individual flourishes in a society. Mm -hmm. So that social knowledge is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, I think so, I think that, and also the idea that uh, there must be a lot of genetic variation yeah. in, the, in the human brain to allow selection to work. Mm -hmm. Selection, um, um, evolution, evolutionary change occurs only when there is genetic variation. Mm -hmm. So that 
it's it's a necessary feature for there to be evolved for the brain to have evolved in the way it has for there to have been genetic control of its variation mm. which uh, we don't we're not accustomed to thinking of something like the brain as being specialized to learn in an evolutionary sense mm -hmm. uh, and not just in a by by ordinary experience it, yeah everybody's always thought that it was the seat of learning where the most learning occurred and that's that, that is probably right, but there was also, it may also be specialised for genetic learning. And we don't know very much about the, uh, what parts, what aspects of the human brain are under gene genetic control, though uh, most of the characteristics, well, we're familiar with the enormous variation in different people's uh, mental attributes. I mean, some yeah. people yeah. musicians, yeah. some people mathematicians, some people. Uh, have greater social skills than others, and so on and so forth. So there, are, there is a great deal of variation. We know that perfectly well. Uh, and the tendency is, has been to attribute a lot of that variation to experience, and that may be true, but there's also the near certainty, I would say, that there's also a lot of genetic variation in these things. So that's the, first, that's the sort of first chapter, so to speak, what I want to, yeah. wanted to say. Um, well, probably we can go on to the second stage if you... Okay, if, if, if you like, yes, yeah, and then, and come, then back. come back. And yeah, yeah, okay. Well, the second stage was um, to follow up what the early comparative neurologists mm -hmm. said about the the role of the cerebral cortex, yeah. which was that it's, uh, it, their conclusion was that it's for knowing about the world, which was described by Hayek, who's one of the very early comparative anatomists oh. in the brain, uh, that it was it formed the filing cabinets of the central executive, meaning this is where all the knowledge uh, base was stored. Yeah. Um, but I think what's changed <clears throat> over the past half century, really, is that we, we now understand very much more uh, what the business of acquiring knowledge consists of. This is because of uh, the, the uh, advances in the theory of statistical decision making and things like that. Uh, and, and, and more recently, there's still the introduction of Bayesian methods and yeah. so on. And made an enormous difference to how we, how we understand about knowledge being the actual process of knowledge acquisition. And, and we, we, obviously I can't do a lecture about basic methods or anything like that. What, what is clear is that the knowledge of the world, the kind of knowledge of the world which is acquired online by experience yeah. consists of knowing how frequently things occur, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and the actual uh, occurrence, the rarity and commonness of all your ordinary events that our brains respond to, yeah. um, and in addition, the statistical structure, that is how, how one thing is associated with, it, with another, mm -hmm. what things occur together, what things occur, don't occur together, and in particular, uh, what things follow each other, the, the, these commonly occurring sequences of things. Those are particularly important because it's the temporal aspects yeah. that last make predictions. And it's obviously the, uh, and there were doubts that if one uh, species is better at predicting things than another, that will have a considerable yeah. advantage. And within a species, one individual who's better at, at um, uh, deciding where the food is or what stock prices are going to go up and so on and yeah. so forth, they're going to do better than somebody else who can't make those predictions. So it's our ability to to identify commonly recurring sequences mm. and, and thereby be able to complete that sequence. That's yeah. what making a prediction is. Mm. You recognize the early steps in a sequence and that enables you to predict the, late, the occurrence of the later steps. So these the temporal aspects are particularly important. I think the, the, you can summarize the change that's happened over the last half century as in our in our knowledge and understanding of these things is that we do really, we, we are beginning to understand how uh, knowledge acquisition 
and, um, and valid inferences, statistical inferences, including predictions, can be made so that we can now program our computers to do it. Mm. Whereas previously, if we wanted to have the most reliable judgments and so on and so forth, we just had to find the, the wisest man we knew, you know, mm. all of them, all of them yeah. and had to make the predi predictions. And mm. They would be able to tell us better than anybody else how to do it. Now, now uh, not only can we program our computers to do it, we understand what a, what a vast problem this is, actually. I mean, it's easy to say uh, acquiring and storing knowledge of the, and using knowledge of the world, but what is actually involved in that is a, is a, a horrendously complicated task, yeah. and especially when you realize that the, these knowledge of the statistics goes down to uh, minute details that we're not at all aware of, but which are, uh, are made use of nonetheless in um, in the kind of things we do all the time. Yeah. So that the brain must have knowledge of the world, not just of, in, a, in some sense, not just of the, the things we consciously recognize, mm. but also of things well below the level of conscious recognition. Mm. Uh, for a, one example of this is a, the thing which I'm interested in now, which is the, um, the ability to analyze movement in images. Yeah. That uh, the, the hypothesis we're testing is that the the way that movement distorts the image mm. is actually made use of by the brain yeah. uh, to determine the direction, of the axis of motion, yeah. and this depends entirely on the fact that uh, almost all naturally occur occurring images mm. have one very pronounced statistical feature. Mm. Uh, which is that they, the low spatial frequencies are much have much bigger amplitudes than the the um, high spatial frequencies. Right. So that um, you picture a sort of peak going up to a peak at low frequencies, and that applies in all directions more or less equally. Mm. There are some slight differences uh, associated with, for example, trees growing vertical and things like that. So mm. there are some natural anisotropies, yeah. but uh, it's the fact, we think that the, the fact that there is this very general feature of natural images mm. makes it possible <coughs> for the brain to interpret any marked anisotropy as due to movement, mm. because that will, will reduce the high spatial frequencies yeah. along the axis of the movement very strongly, mm. so that your, what is initially a fairly symmetrical mountain, like a volcano, so to speak, mm. uh, becomes squeezed in one direction. And we think the brain makes use of that squeezing mm. to determine the actual axis of motion. Mm. But that's a, just one example. Uh, we, there are many other examples where what a, a habitual, a normal property of the input from the world is made use of to, to pick out what is unusual and abnormal. And as I say, this has been, has been an enormous change in how well we understand these processes mm. over the past 50 years. So that's, mm. I think, given us a, a new insight into what the brain must do. Mm. And that's, I, I, I think, about all I can go into without being much more technical. Yeah, than that. Uh, <coughs> yeah I would be personally interested in going into much technical terms, but uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, the magazine for general leadership more maybe uh, yeah I should take the position of a general leader uh, <laughs> as for example uh, so you mentioned something interesting about the unconscious processing playing a large part in statistical statistical learning do you have any insight on the <coughs> division of labor so to speak uh, between conscious and unconscious processing in this statistical learning uh, well, I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is that the, the the things we're consciously aware of yeah. are the things which it's which we first of all, if we're consciously aware of it, we're in a position to explain it to other people. Uh -huh. If we're not consciously aware of it, we're not. No, right. Uh, so that uh, those aspects of the statistics of the world, which are really for self 
consumption, which involve what goes on in my own brain, yeah. uh, but are not of interest to outsiders, then you don't expect to be conscious of that. But, but nevertheless, they can have a big effect on on how the system works. Yeah. Um, the an example of this is perhaps the uh, motion after effect. Mm. Every every is familiar with this. That uh, uh, if you it's often called the waterfall effect. Yeah. If you look at a waterfall and then look at stationary foliage next door, it appears to move upwards. Yeah. Well, in that case, one is conscious of the downward movement that gave rise to this, yeah. but it's not because of that conscious awareness that we, when we look sideways at a, a stationary object, it appears to move upwards. Mm, that yeah. that's, is not the consequence of our conscious experience, right. but in, in, or is in, result, result of mechanisms which are occurring well below the level of mm. consciousness. Uh, and so, um, with other, almost many, many other, process, well, many other adaptation processes of a type which are very similar to the motion after effect. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we adapt to them. But it's not because we have been consciously aware of them that we adapt. It's something occurring at a pre-conscious level. Mm. Do you have any comments on the origin of language from you? Your particular point? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, amazing. I mean, first of all, it's absolutely obvious that the language is of social significance. Yeah. So that one expects to see language in primitive forms in yeah. other social animals. And of course, there's, there's language of bees and there must be, for example, hunting dogs yeah. communicate with each other, but I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's known how they communicate mm. with each other. Mm. But in, if you if you think of a, a a group of dogs hunting, they must have quite complicated messages to deliver to each other. Mm. You know, saying you hold back there for the left and you go on round there yeah. behind, uh, or suggesting that. Mm. Uh, but I don't I don't know how they do it. Uh, But presumably with humans too, uh, a lot of that communication is not directly. Do you think language originated in the process of statistical, statistical learning and acquiring knowledge, in your sense, uh, about the world? Um, no, but you, uh, what you communicate by language, yeah. uh, if it's not reliable, it's no use. Right. So you, it must have been uh, the, the what we're consciously aware of mm -hmm. must have been through the statistical so to speak. Right. We're only aware of things tend to be only aware of things which are significant. It's yeah. quite difficult to uh, to pick up the the very weak, barely significant statistical messages. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the the process of Sitting, what comes into our enters our mind to do that is quite, quite complicated. Yeah. Well, shall I go on and, and yes. talk about the right. yeah. um, I think just just to finish off the sec section about knowing about the world, uh, it it's the message that I want to carry over from that is that. Uh, the brain has mechanisms for sieving the input, incoming information for statistical significance, so that what we are aware of and what enters our mind is largely consists of what is uh, statistically significant. And we reject things uh, which are not statistically significant because that is important for what I'm going to affect, end up by saying. So, um, What I want in this part is to, to describe, um, to say something about what I've just been talking about, what that implies about our minds, and what, what we have to change in the way we look at our minds. And, of course, every, everybody has their own view about the mind, and um, I, I can't possibly give a historical survey or anything like that about what this, but I think a generally accepted modern view 
is that um, each each person has a window on the world, so to speak, and uh, what is in their minds is the result of what enters it through that window. And this fits our own views that I, I'm I have a, a what's in my mind at the moment is what I can see in this room in front of me, and uh, you sitting and discussing these problems with me and so on. Um, and I think it's the view we have about other people's minds too, that they are also receiving an input yeah. from through the, through the window which admits, which links the world with what's the contents of the mind. Um, of course, what we each do slightly different things, but what enters through this window, I mean, I compare, I compare it with my previous experience and I am able to recognize you, for example, or another person wouldn't, because I've known you before, yeah. and I recognize the things in this room, because I've been in this room before, and so on. So that uh, uh, everybody treats what comes in through their mind differently, yeah. to, a, to a quite a large extent. Yeah. Uh, and we all, there's a difference in, um, because of that we all have different experiences, and this is the, the past experience is accessible to our mind as well as current experience. We can um, we we combine the current input through the window with our previous experience, mm -hmm. and that that of course is all also all all, all different. But I think that's only we're really only looking at half the picture about the mind if we look at it that way as, as passively receiving information and combining it with other previous uh, received information. And you've got to look at the other half in order to put, to understand the nature of the mind and consciousness and put it in its proper biological perspective. So I just want to uh, re recall to you what I said about what man, mankind's big brain uh, the, the, perhaps its main is very largely the product of self-domestication by um, self by the other members of our species, and that it, it, for that reason, it, it specialised. It, the kind of knowledge we acquire was certainly specialised for social knowledge yeah. as much as for anything else, and that the process of self-domestication is very important in this. So. Uh, Taking this into account, yes, it's true that uh, we observe the social world unfolding before us by looking at it, by, by what enters this window. But what's in biologically important about this is that we can, we can actually describe the contents of, of the, what's entering our mind in this way and pass it on and communicate it to others. Uh, if we didn't, if we weren't able to do that, uh, it might have some value in in helping us to uh, select our own, to modify our own behaviour. I mean, if we, for example, in, uh, if we observe that, um, if we know that from our previous observations that uh, talking about a particular problem always makes somebody angry, uh, then we can, uh, when we, when conversation is veering in that direction. We can steer it somewhere else to avoid making a person angry, which might be to our benefit. So that uh, we, the, the, what enters our, through our mind can be to our, our, what is in our conscious mind can be to our advantage. But the thing which makes, which we, but there's a lot of unconscious, as we were discussing earlier, there's a lot of unconscious things, things we're not conscious of, which modify our brains and are to our advantage as, as well. But what's unique about the consci conscious things is that we can communicate to others. So this is, brings us to a, another obvious thing. We're not only social animals, but we're also cooperative. We cooperate with, e with each other. And our ability to cooperate is obviously what has made human civilizations radically different from any uh, any social organization mm. of, of other animals. Yeah. I mean, even chimpanzees, which are perhaps the most advanced, um, they, they, don't, um, they don't have 
a, a culture and a civilization where we do, mm. where, where we, can put, we can not only communicate immediately, but we can write it down and pass it on to other people. Yeah. This is what makes human culture and civilization unique. Mm. And that depends critically on the, um, the fact that we can communicate the content of what's coming in through this. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, window onto onto the world. Sorry about this. <laughs> so it's the, the communicability of yeah. of, of our. Um, Conscious experience seems to me to make it make it crucially important. I don't go well, thanks so much. Mm. Oh, put it down, yes, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm. <coughs> so what what this means is that it's the people puzzle about consciousness and say that uh, it's difficult to see what its biological advantage is, but I think that uh, it's not only. Is it biological advantage obvious, but it's also widely recognized that it's way, the way we link to other humans and so that to see the, the, the necessary feature for humans to live in the kind of uh, culture and civili social culture and civilization we do live in without being able to, to constantly communicate with each other. Yeah. We couldn't conceivably have the kind of Cultural civilization, which is humanity's unique feature. Yeah. So, the, how, why, why then do we have to change our minds about our minds? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that um, we, we tend to think of the content of our minds as being our, our own, mm -hmm. so it's our unique to ourselves. Yeah. But that's not true. It's it's what's what's important about it is that we can that we can communicate it to others, so that mm -hmm. the contents of our minds. Is there not only for the use of our own minds, but for the use of other minds? It's right. not. It's not just for our own use. Mm. And I think. I, I think that is. Um, that aspect of of, of the mind and consciousness does tend to be overlooked by people. They do tend to think of it, at, at least at this time, as being something unique to each individual, mm. and. Um, and that must be why it's important, but that is not necessarily why it's important. It's because it can be shared with other people that makes it important. Mm. Imagine, if, if you, can, you can get a picture of, of, of how important it is. If you imagine, um, when our, most people are familiar with robots in, in, and the kind of things they can do in some shape or form, yeah. but of course they don't cooperate with each other. No. But supposing you want to make robots cooperate with each other, then they've got to be able to communicate what they're actually doing at one moment to another robot. Right. And that, that would demand something very similar to consciousness. Mm. So we don't, we don't attribute... And by the way, animals, only rarely do we, do we understand how they communicate with other animals. Mm. And, uh, the closer they come to communicating with other animals, particularly with us, mm. the more we are inclined to attribute consciousness to them. So you don't want to deny your dog consciousness because it mm. undoubtedly does communicate with you and you communicate with it and it responds and so on. Mm. So it's that cooperative aspect that, um, that leads us to attribute consciousness to other animals. Mm. Whether um, bees obviously communicate with each other and, and other social animals do, mm. uh, I don't particularly mind the idea that bees bees are conscious, or certainly not the dogs are conscious, and, and other social animals too. I mean, when, they, why, shouldn't they, why do we, should we be so unwilling to admit that they can have any conscious experience? It doesn't seem to make sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, as you say, it's a kind of very <coughs> an o overlooked point, I think, about uh, the functional significance of consciousness, uh, what you mentioned about this, mm. the importance of social um, communication. Well, that's good. Yeah. Mm. Sharing the. Do, I'm 
I'm kind of, you know, I'm curious. Uh, you know, as far as I understand, um, statistical, statistical learning theory has been concerned with what goes on in an individual's brain, like uh, in the motion uh, perception problem yeah. that you mentioned. When you put uh, the social communication aspects aspect into picture, how do you think that changes the framework of uh, the whole story, kind of statistical learning paradigm? Uh, do you have any? Well, I, I think social judgments yeah. are often based on much more uncertain evidence than, than other other judgments. So the statistical aspects are even more important there. If you oh. don't know how to use small samples, you're not going to be very good socially. <laughs> yeah. So that, uh, and of course, statistics comes in. People say, "Oh, this is not a statistical problem because you have one shot learning." But of course, that's completely wrong. It's the ability to um, to make a, a decision from a single experience mm -hmm. means that you're, you're making good use. Of your previous experience, you know that this is the, a single example mm -hmm. is way out of line <coughs> from the whole of the, the rest of the, that population you're comparing right, it right. with. So that uh, the fact that it's based on small small samples does not mean that statistics is less important; it means it's more important. Mm. Yeah, I see. What, what you mean. Um, yeah. Um, so. And uh, you know, the other thing, of course, about social uh, behaviour compared to other behaviour, people don't, when you're riding a bicycle, you don't often make a mistake. Well, you do occasionally, but yeah. only very rarely. Whereas uh, if you have a, a keen social eye, mm -hmm. you see people making mistakes all the time. <laughs> I can see that, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a much more dicey business. Yeah. And some of the mistakes people make, probably by accident, have extremely serious consequences. They get yeah. their heads chopped off or going there. Yeah. <laughs> so, in your view, uh, these social judgments or learning, uh, what is the division of labor again between conscious and unconscious? Uh, well, I, I would say that, uh, that one is little conscious of the, the, the vast amount of information that comes into one's, eye, into one's eyes and ears and nose and so on, um, which is primarily of, for internal consumption mm. only mm. and does not uh, involve other people. Mm. But uh, bits of information which have significance for other people are the ones which you become conscious of. Mm. I see, so being conscious of some aspect of your cognition means, uh, has a double meaning, you mean. I mean, it makes you aware of your own internal state, so to speak, and at the same time being able to communicate it to yes. but, but, others. Yes, but then you are able to communicate it to others. And it's that aspect which is biologically important. Mm. Well, not only, because it, uh, it can also be important um, for... Uh, perhaps one should talk about what's, what's involved in making it communicable to others. Mm. It's not only that you've got to... Uh, it's got to be... There's got to be a very direct link with the speech centres, and yes. it's got to be... Uh, you've got to be able to make the links to the correct words in your vocabulary and so on. But it's the the existence of that, uh, the framework implied by that vocabulary and your knowledge, your existing knowledge of language, which makes it possible to communicate to other people at all. If, you, if you and I don't have a language in common, mm. uh, we find it very difficult to communicate the contents of our mind yeah. to each other. Yeah. No, no, you, to some extent one can do so. I mean, uh, you can, with sign language, you can direct a person to go that way and that way and that way and, yeah. and so on, uh, if you understand where they want to get to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, 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 there are non-linguistic means of communication, or if you just look aggressive, you know, that, yeah, yeah. that's a communication too. 
So that uh, those people are, are very very good at picking up these cues. They can uh, they can pick up the non-verbal cues very effectively, very rapidly and easily. Yeah. But um, the the interesting part of communication is the language part because it's so much more detailed. And, yeah. And what's more, it can be it can be um, written down. It can be permanent. You can, mm. uh, you can, you can write a paper about it yeah. and uh, communicate it to other people, future ge generations, and so on. Mm. Or even another way of doing this is by uh, painting a picture. And um, clearly, I mean, this was something that happened quite early in in well, not we don't know how early in 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 uh, the development of modern human communities, but I, any any civilization worth its name has artifacts which were clearly permanent records of something that they wanted other people to know about. Mm. And they couldn't have done that without, I would say, being consciously aware of it. Yeah, these artifacts would presumably represent uh, statistically salient features of the environment or well yes I mean I think the uh, <coughs> of prehistoric cave drawings they, they, they the animals have quite recognizable and mm. accurate uh, features as far as we know about those animals by other means mm. uh, so that uh, it, it's, it's reliable knowledge that they're communicating there may also be um, you know, a lot of symbolization may symbolize unreliable knowledge, and after yeah. all, we really have to consider all the religious pictures are reliable, yeah. <laughs> and not, not all that knowledge is reliable. Um, some people have argued actually um, that uh, one shot running is, as you say, one shot running is probably a very good instance of statistical learning. Mm. And uh, some people have actually argued that uh, in order to have one shot learning, you need to have consciousness and have m some highly developed cognitive system to accompany it. And one of the evidence is that, uh, you know, in these ambiguous figures, when you digitize uh, pictures into black and white and you make people judge what is represented by the picture, uh, adults can make one-shot learning when, uh, when you, once you realize something in the picture, you keep that in mind forever. Mm -hmm. But there is some evidence, I think, I read some paper, uh, that preschool children are not able to do that uh, until a sub certain age. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is rigorously established, but um, so, in a nutshell, what do you think, you know, in order to do uh, one-shot learning, which in your term is an excellent statistical learning, do you think we need uh, some special faculty, so to speak, in the cortex? And if so, what would it be? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think the kind of thing that you were talking about, yeah. um, well, the experiments that I can relevant to this I can think of are some of the some of the difficult stereo problems. Mm -hmm. um, you you don't. Get the stereo picture. It's a run dot yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's one of a, a spiral coming up towards you mm. um, that I remember. And when you first look at that, you can't make any sense of it. But after a period of perhaps as long as a minute or even several minutes, mm. uh, you get the you get the impression. Yeah. And then thereafter, whenever you look at that thing, you see it immediately. Yeah. Uh, so that something's happened in the brain that's left a permanent impression yes. um, and you're able to um, you said to speak, formed a new concept which is this new picture mm 
and you subsequently have access to that. Um, I don't know whether that all occurs in V1 or whether it uh, uh, requires other areas. Very likely it does. It's difficult to say. Uh, but, but another example of one-shot learning is that, um, and well, of this is perceptual learning. Another is, you know, do you know the picture of the Dalmatian yeah, dog? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which again, you know, once you've seen that, mm. whenever you see it again, you recognise it at once. Right. Yeah. Not always. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you make use of the fact that there's trees in the background and things like that. Yeah. You said, oh, that's why this is that, the background for that dog. You recognise that first. Therefore, the dog must be there. You can see. Mm. Um, so again, you've formed a new concept, mm. and once you've formed it, then you, you can recognise it immediately. Mm. And I would imagine that it doesn't have to be the identical picture mm. of the Dal Dalmatian. You but mean? if you had, um, uh, if you had, if you took. Um, several pictures from slightly different viewpoints and so on, they would all be different, but yet once you've seen one of them, you'll be able to recognize other ones. Mm, there would be some generalization? Gen yes. Uh. General generalization around the, the concept of a Dalmatian dog. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite interesting what you said about <coughs> virtual learning as an instance of statistical learning. Right? Actually, I have been doing some research on... You were talking about the neuro economics. And also, which, yes. and also the animation type picture. Oh, yes. yes. I, I've been kind of, kind of setting up a mega lab type. Uh, you know, I've been teaching courses at universities mm -hmm. and I, where I have access to over 100 subjects, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I measured the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires these sub students to realize what's in the picture. Mm. Using the Dalmatian or Dallenbacher's cow, or mm. the uh, quite famous one um, depicting Jesus Christ. I wonder if you have come across this one. Mm, I don't, no, what, uh, and uh, a map of um, of the Mediterranean area. Oh yeah. These are quite effective. And mm. what you find very interesting is that there are two processes. One is a very fast process where mm. the number of people who have realized what's in the picture, uh, by a certain time, uh, behaves like that in a kind of exponential yeah, way, yeah. which is very first. Um, well, presumably going up, the number of people, in, it increases. No, uh, most of the people realize as soon as they see it. Yeah. So if, if you die, sorry, sorry, if this is a diagram, I mean, histogram, sorry. Yeah. So the number, the, the time at which the number of people... Yeah, so uh, it goes uh, like that. Is this time? Oh, uh, yeah. Then, uh, so, so, like that. so this is the first... Yes. But if they fail to realize that, that uh, by a certain time, then yeah. there is this very slow process, which seems almost like a Poisson process, because mm. it, uh, the number of people who realize in this time being uh, distribute it almost uniformly in right. this fashion. So it can take as long as, for example, 10 minutes, 20 minutes sometimes to yeah. <laughs> realize. Yeah. So I, but, uh, so but they I, do eventually realize it, do they? Uh, some people do. <laughs> well, some people fail to. Yeah, some people fail to do yes. it. Um, yeah. Some people actually can't see uh, what's in the picture, even after they were taught uh -huh. what's in the yeah. picture. So, yeah. and what do you say about this? Relationship between you know statistical learning and one-shot learning is quite interesting. I, I I think I need to think of that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think a typical example of one one-shot learning is you know something like uh, getting stung by a wasp or something like that. So getting stung by a wasp or um, the insect, uh, you know, if you yeah. uh, uh, once you have uh, once you've been stunned by a wasp and identified, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. then you know, right, yeah. not going to have anything to do with that right. picture yes, again. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and well, that's there true, again, yeah. I mean, it, it's because you've made use of the fact that normally when an insect just lights on your skin, mm -hmm. you don't, it doesn't sting you. So that you, you, it's the background of knowledge of 
that you don't get this kind of pain without there being a cause like that, yeah. that um, enables to make the, the, the very rapid and uh, decisive decision not to have anything to do with wasps again. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true, yeah. But um, you couldn't do it without, if there was if there was a lot of interference from non-stinging wasps, for example. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think your argument is quite strong in mm. that, yeah, I, I, I can see, yeah. Um. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's a bit, statistics is what, such a painful subject to many people, that they don't, yeah, want, to, they don't want to admit that it's of any importance brain, at all mm -hmm. in the important things the brain does. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was, well, when I was brought up, I was, um, I was, I think, I quite usually. Many of the people who taught me said, you know, that don't worry about statistics. All you all you have to do is just repeat the experiment, and uh, it'll be obvious. There's no need to actual actually do the the hard work of statistics because, but of course, that all, what that means is that we're naturally quite good at statistics, and in our judgments. Yeah, yeah. Are uh, not very much worse than those the judgments you can reach by actually keeping notes and doing the calculations. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that that, that process is unimportant. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, I, I think that the the changes in our understanding of statistical problems over the last half century or so. I mean, not not making not saying that. There wasn't progress before then, but mm. but over the last half century or so, we understand much better how statistics is the basis for all judgment and mm. all acquisition of knowledge and so on. It must be. There's no other way of doing it. Mm. Yeah. Nowadays, you can just um, use Excel to... <laughs> <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Though Excel won't help help you if you're not looking for the right thing. Yeah, that, yeah that's <laughs> also true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if they did, yeah. 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 I would like to ask you, you know, your, something about your personal history or personal background. And oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Why do you, why you, you know, why you were led to study what you've been studying and all these kind of things. Oh yes, I, I didn't talk about that. I, when I was at school, yeah. I was um, more interested in, in physics. I was never, never interested really? in chemistry for some reason, yeah. but I, I was interested in physics and, um, uh, and, and, um, and to some extent mathematics too. Oh. But I, uh, I realised quite an early age, partly as I, as I now realise that I was at school with some quite exceptional people, yeah. <laughs> that, I, that I wasn't in the top class when it came to, to mathematics and physics. Uh -huh. I, was, I was at school with them, the two people who impressed me particularly were Freeman Dyson and James Lightfield, uh -huh. and, uh, and that's not really a fair comparison with the average school boy. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> uh, but then, uh, and there were a number of other very good mathematicians at, at the school I happened to be at. So, and that, so I got interested in biology. Yeah. And I also had a very good, um, a very good biology teacher, mm. Lucas, his name was, who, who, who um, uh, sort of aroused my interest in biological yeah. problems. Yeah. And also, uh, the, 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 my mother was a very keen botanist. Mm. And also very interested in genetics. She was, right. um, and also was um, was very interested in, in her in her grandfather Charles Darwin, and so was um, felt that um, evolution was one of the major, most important, which was not fashionable at that time. So in the early Darwin has only become fashionable, I would say, in the last thirty or forty years. Mm. Uh, but when I was growing up, when I was a child, he was um, it was he was much respected by uh, other biologists and so on. But he didn't have the universal acceptance. And, mm. uh, 
hero worship that he has yeah. now. Except Banoella, who who's always uh, always felt, obviously, that evolution was absolutely basic biological discovery. Uh -huh. um, so and she passed some of that enthusiasm for it on to me, you know, explaining how little details and so on. Mm. So I got interested in, in biology. And then I uh, and it's the natural thing to I got interested but I was also interested in the in mechanisms mm. and that was in this is in the sort of when I was deciding on my career, I suppose in the late thirties really. Um, and the combination of the two, the sort of ability to apply physics to living things, yeah. that was best done, in, done more in physiological departments yeah. it, than in ordinary biology departments, which is why I went into physiology. Now, actually, there was another family connection there. My, my mother grew up in Cambridge, and uh, she was a friend of the Adrians. Adrian. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. And um, and he was a professor of physiology. Yeah. There, so, uh, um, and that actually steered me a bit in that direction too. And then when I when I did when I was doing physiology, um, I got interested in statistics largely by um, first of all my my interest in vision. And the realization that, um, that quanta, the quantal variation is important in vision. Yeah. And at that point, I thought I'd better try and learn some statistics. I'd never been to a statistics course in my life. Uh, and in fact, as I said, you know, the general attitude among scientists was well, sometimes you have to use statistics, but that's usually because uh, you, you haven't done, done enough experiments. Yeah. Uh, so, I then read, read Fisher's book, and that was, and that I found, that there's no book that divides people so much as that. I, I found it absolutely fascinating, and mm. uh, uh, became very enthusiastic about statistics from then on, onwards. But other people uh, found it as dull as ditch water and would have nothing to do with it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got interested in statistics. Though. There was another another reason was that I was very fortunate in some of the friends and colleagues I had when I was an undergraduate. I belonged to something called the Natural Sciences Club, which was a small group of about 20 people, and we used to give talks to each other about various topics. And later, there was I was. Um, came across Tommy Gold, who's a physicist, and he was, who died just uh, a year and a bit ago, mm. uh, who was, um, had an extraordinary range of topics he was interested in. He was, um, he's, perhaps he's best known as being one of the three who were in, behind the continuous creation theory. He was oh, a mm. with, with Bondi and Hoyle. Yeah. Um, but he was also interested in biology. He, he did some experiments on hearing. Mm. Um, but he was also he he and he was he was a wonderful person for explaining things, you know, and uh, sort of concepts of signal and noise. Mm. Uh, he talking to him, you, you got much, you understood these things much clear, more clearly than even from reading Fisher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and I, and uh, so I went to along to another group in um, centred in London from a, a friend of mine here who went up to work at Queen Square in London and the, the person who did um, electroencephalography there somehow came across um, Shannon information theory and right. thought well this obviously has relevance to the brain so he started a small discussion group and I met many other people there Including Alan Turing through that group actually, mm. and um, Warren McCulloch came and talked to us. Mm. Uh, Dennis Gabor didn't, but Donald Mackay, mm. who was a graduate student of yeah. Dennis Gabor, he he, uh, he was a member of it, and so we talked about things like chess playing, computers, and 
how computers worked in the first place, because of course they were, they were very young then. <laughs> um, so that's how my ideas about these things developed. Yeah. And then uh, another impetus to, to it was when, uh, when uh, um, I started recording from nerve fibers. And I, w yeah. I went over to Steve Kuffler's lab for a year, oh, and he was recording from uh, retinal ganglion cells in yeah. cats. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the output of a retinal ganglion cell, but it's a most incredibly irregular, noisy discharge you can imagine. I mean, it mm. sounds like pure noise, mm. and yet it enables the animal to see. You know, and mm. that, that clearly has got to be analysed. It has to be analysed by the brain. So I got very interested in the in neural noise from that experience. And uh, you know, also, it was, it's surprising now because everybody, everybody, for example, doing psychophysics is um, uh, realizes the importance of false positive responses. No. If, you're, if, you're, if you're sitting down and being asked to make responses to dim flashes of light, every now and then you make a mistake and you you actually claim to see a flash when there was no light, no flash there at all. Mm. Well, many people up until about 19, the late 1930s uh, thought that that was a human error and that um, it was just because your subject was not being careful enough. Mm. And so, for example, by accident, Maurice Perrin was one of uh, Selig Hecht collaborators on their, in their famous experiment on detecting quantum fluctuations. Mm -hmm. uh, and he told me that uh, false positive responses were simply not allowed in that laboratory. And if any subject gave a single false positive <laughs> response, so utterly, regarded as utterly unreliable and never used <laughs> again. Yeah. So the idea that the, the, there was a uh, of noise being prevalent Mm. Uh, even in a, uh, in, in a simpler situation, was really very alien to a lot of people at that time. Mm. Nowadays, of course, it, everybody's heard of signal detection theory, and it's why everybody recognises mm. that, that um, the brain is a noisy animal. So to mm. Yeah. Mm. So. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Are you going to are you, are you going to write this? Are you? Uh, uh, first, yes, yeah, uh, because I guess nobody else can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, of course they will do the editing and yeah, so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I'm chiefly responsible for yeah. scientific content. Yeah. And will you write it in English? Uh, not in the final product. But, no. Uh, well, I might make a summary. I mean, I mean, if you want regular. to send me something for me to look at, yeah, yeah, I'm I can very do glad that. To, to help. Yes, I can do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Even if it's only, so to speak, in rough draft. Yeah, yeah, sure. Form. Yes. Yeah. Um, d do you want? So in your, in, your, in your view, uh, what has been the most significant um, achievement in understanding human mind? And also, what is the greatest obstacle in understanding it? So two yeah. related yeah, interesting questions. questions. Um, Well, um, I think at one extreme, um, the ability to record from single neurons mm. and to understand how single neurons work 
uh, is one of the greatest achievements. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the obstacles to further progress is not knowing enough about what a single neuron can do. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we've, um, we have a picture, which is, after all, taken half a century or so, more yeah. really, to build up of, of um, what a neuron can do, and it fires impulses and so on and so forth. But it's the cells in the brain, in the mammalian brain, the pyramidal cells, are very large. Yeah. And uh, there's an awful lot of intracellular machinery there, mm. which we don't know very much about, uh, and which, whose functional role well, I think inclined to underestimate because we say, well, it's got all the nucleus and all the mechanism for turning on genes, turning off genes, and so on. But these are all employed in the process of building a brain and development, and they're not involved in everyday use. But that may be quite wrong. There may be a, a lot of intracellular mechanisms going on, which are important, particularly for uh, things occurring over the time scale of seconds to minutes, um, which we were completely ignorant of. Mm. We, we tend to think of the of the nerve cells as acting on a sort of millisecond time scale, yeah. but there are cell processes. Mm. It's interesting that Donald Hebb, uh, who, who was a sort of pioneer of, of understanding the brain in terms of how the neurons, what neurons do, uh, he was, if you read his book, uh, he was led to the idea of neural assemblies and the, uh, uh, simply because he thought that there were no there were no processes occurring at a longer time scale in, in the um, in these nerve cells, and a, a totally different line about this is that the uh, the knowledge built up about what go, of how how single bacteria control our lives, I and mean, they have they have elaborate mechanisms for determining how they move, yeah. um, when they reproduce, and so on and so forth. And this, uh, you, you can get, I, when I last did the calculation, I came up with the answer of quarter of a million E. coli inside a single uh, pyramidal cell. And each of these E. coli has quite elaborate decision-making mechanisms inside itself. So yeah. that uh, or don't put it another way, yeah. uh, not quite so dramatic, but uh, a single pyramidal cell has something like 10,000 uh, terminals, yeah. nerve terminals on it, each on a bouton, yeah. um, which is a postsynaptic structure. Now, each of those boutons is of the order of size of a single bacterium. Mm. So each of those can have mechanisms within it, within it of the order of complexity of those that determine the E. coli's life. Yeah. So we may, we may be very very seriously underestimating what goes on, and this would be, be particularly important over the time scale of, of uh, mm. seconds and perhaps minutes. You know, I mean, the phenomenon which uh, you will become familiar with as you grow older of not being able to remember somebody's name, and then by some sort of magical process over a, over a period of about fifteen seconds or a minute, the answer comes up. Now, this is, uh, uh, I don't believe that's a cooperative effect of lots of neurons. I think that's going on in a single mm. nerve cell, that something it, it triggered something that just wasn't quite enough, and it's growing and growing, and finally it comes up. But anyway, that's about, that's a, one, that's a one, one extreme. So, but at the other extreme, um, the the fact that different parts of the brain specialise in different things. Uh, there was a, a terribly misleading idea going around that of equipotency and um, mass action uh, in, well, only about 50 years ago, these ideas were very prevalent. And, and, and it's undoubtedly true that a lot of people very interested in the brain still think that it's this some. Um, these mass action things that are going to be where, where the real important secret lies. I don't think that's true at all. I think it's, it's as I was saying, that it's the other, other extreme single, uh, of what we don't know about single cells is a major obstacle. 
and that these cooperative things, they are interesting and important. And of course, a big progress in further localization is going on with the fMRI uh, and things. That's, a, uh, that's opening up field. Mm. But it is only telling us where things go on. It doesn't tell us what goes on. Mm. And the other... Well, I think one of the future areas which is shown has great possibilities is understanding the genetics better, mm. because after all, this is um, understanding can lead to an enormous increase of understanding not only of how the brain develops, but also of the actual uh, variation between brains and. Yeah. Uh, and these, as I was saying before, this must be a crucially important aspect of, of what is, how the brain has evolved. So does that answer your question? Yeah, that <laughs> uh, reminds me of, I really need to answer, uh, ask this question, as, which is, uh, what is your current stance on the grandmother cell story? Uh, on what? Grand, grandmother cell. Oh, grandma, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, uh, I think there's a very good aspect of it that um, it, the idea, by the way, is not mine. It, it comes from uh, I read about this in yeah, I, in, actually, yeah, 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 I, I, it, was, it, yeah. it was Jerry Latvin who was yeah. uh, was perhaps more behind it than anybody else. Um, and it draws attention to the fact that a single cell can do something which is intelligible on a macro scale yeah. and, uh, uh, and, and important in the life of the animal. Mm. So that those, are, and those are two concepts which people didn't have before because they, after all the cortex has uh, 10 to the 7 neurons or whatever the latest number is uh, and um, what can and one single one of them, you might think, played a trivial part, you know, just like one, one, uh, uh, one cell, memory cell, for example, in a computer, or the, the operation lasting a, a microsecond or yeah. um, a tenth of a microsecond, whatever it is. So um, uh, the, the idea of the grandmother cell says no, no, single cells are important, and they, they do things. Many of them do things which are intelligible on the scale of the overall behavior of the animal. But the actual choice of grandmother uh, for such a cell seems to me appalling. Uh, because uh, if, if you do have cells which do important things, you've got to select what, what they're selected for very carefully. And of course, most animals don't know their grandmothers. Why could they have a grandmother cell in there? It so happens that humans are an exception. Yeah. Uh, we do know our grandmothers usually, or sometimes, yeah. but in m most species, they have no, no, the grandmother is a completely alien and useless concept. Mm -hmm. So why have a cell for it? Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, it's, it's a, uh, a cretinous mm -hmm. um, concept. And of course, it's also, we, don't, we do need to remember the fact that there are a very large number of cells in the brain. And we, and we still don't really understand why there have to be that number. I mean, after all, you think what, see what you can do with 30,000 genes. Mm. And, um, and here we have to have 10 million, 10, yeah, 10 million uh, nerve cells to, um, to, uh, to, to get anywhere. It's, uh, it's crazy. You know. 10 billion, I should say. Mm. Mm. Do you have any idea why? We need so many neurons. Um, well, I think it's, I think sparse co coding is one of the things that, that uh, <coughs> it's because they, the cells are highly selective. Uh, you need a very large number of them, mm. but the numbers are, it's difficult to think in terms of these large numbers. After all, with them, um, we with a vocabulary. 30,000 words is quite a lot, mm. so that with 30,000 entities yeah. properly used, uh, you can write a novel, and um, uh, that's, 
you're getting that the what that describes is something of the order of complexity of human behavior yeah. so uh, when you get up to that number of things we don't, we, we don't need and incidentally uh, of those 30,000 words they are very sparsely coded and 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 so and you still in need of a fancy mm. number but uh, in the human brain it's got uh, I'm just looking at the sensory side alone uh, you know a vast spectrum the high capacity channel leading into the brain and you've got to have a lot of neurons there to handle it and with, with sparse coding does solve a lot of the or I think helps to understand a lot of things to do with binding for example that um, if if each of these entities corresponds to something highly specific then uh, when when and with local coding if there are two such things occurring in a fairly localized region of the brain they are likely to be associated mm. in the outside world mm. and so that is a partial solution to the binding problem mm. and it's, it's everything that's a step in the right direction mm. Jerry Lepvin was, yes, it was incidentally uh, another thing which he's never given credit for, uh, but, but which is true, is that uh, he was the first person I ever heard talking about the importance of uh, using natural images. Oh, was he? Yes. Oh. Um, so that he, um, <coughs> when he was recording from Franz Retina, he didn't use a... a a microscope and spots of lights to project on the retina, that kind of thing. He had a, a use the eyes own, own optical system, and then showed it pictures of uh, a pond with lilies in it, you know, and oh, insects yeah, yeah. like that. So he was he was very keen on using the uh, oh. using natural stimuli. <coughs> Why doesn't the name grandmother sir, caught on kind of people's? You know, if, yeah, as you say, it, it has little biological significance, but somehow it has captured people's imagination. Yes. Do you have any comment or insight on? <laughs> well, I think it was because. Um, well, I think it's a, a, a double thing, isn't yeah. it? Uh, it's um, not only is it, does it have the convey the idea that it's something you don't see a gra you don't see your grandmother every day no. so it's a rare event uh, and you have these cells reserved for these rare events mm. uh, but it's also something to do with the, the concept of hierarchy you know mm -hmm. uh, and it's, um, the, a, a grandmother is part of a hierarchy, so yeah. it conveys, in one shot, so to speak, the idea of rarity and and a hierarchy, I which is which I think is, uh, from that point of view, it's okay. But the what it conceals is the fact that um, well, there's an interesting fact about coding. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that I can convey this idea very very well, but um, if you think of if you think of representing uh, a an image, which is um, let's say 256 by 256 or something, so you, it, it's got to whatever that squared is uh, degrees of freedom, and so you only need uh, uh, you only need to specify the value of every every pixel, for example. And, and you've determined the image. So that tells you the dimensionality of it straight away. But what is not so obvious is that if you take um, other, another set of basis functions, uh, you will also only need the same number, and they're orthogonal, for example. Mm. You will also only need that same number. So that um, if you take Fourier components, for example, you only need 256 squared of these components to also determine the image. Yeah. 
Now, if you if you then do a um, uh, independent component analysis and say, well, we're going to use these this to select our basis function. Yeah. Again, you only need 256 of them, mm -hmm. but you can you can select these this um, uh, 256 squared basis functions in an enormous variety of different ways, yeah. and any one of them will do it. Yeah. So that when you're using a, a more complicated set of um, basis functions to represent the image, you can at the same time. You, you needn't be nearly so precise in the way you select them. Obviously, when you're doing when you're doing pixels, mm. you've got to be careful that you choose each pixel once and only once. Mm. Uh, so you can't just take a random set of pixels. But when you have an enormous selection of possible basis functions, you can be very much more careless in in how you select them. Right. Um, so that that means that well, maybe you can get maybe that grandmother cell uh, and a, a number of other equally crazily chosen uh, functions of the image uh, will enable you to reconstruct it completely. Mm. So then, having got that idea, we then say, well, wait a minute now, we're going to use these um, activities in these units for more than just representing the image. We've got to learn about it, for example. And it's no good um, choosing as one of your basis functions mm. something which is only activated once in every ten years, mm. because that will, you're not employing it fairly. So you, what you want to do is to choose things which occur frequently. Mm. So you know one of the ways you might do it is to take um, the first 250, 256 squared separate images you see mm. and use each of them as a basis function, mm. and that would probably be pretty good. That would probably uh, see you through the rest of your life pretty well if you could do, if you could use them in various combinations. Mm. But then we, you could do even better than that, because in the first 256 images you experience, these are not going to be ones which are particularly significant events, mm. and it would clearly, for purposes of learning and so on, it'd be much better if you took this rather limited number of whole images, uh, if the things which were important in your life. So you might take an image that occurred short, short the, image, the baby might take an image it's, it saw shortly before it was first fed, for example, because mm -hmm. that's a predictor of feeding. Mm -hmm. That's something you sort of know. Mm -hmm. So we'll take the image of the mother's face and so on. So you can build up a set of, um, this is all complete fantasy, of course, uh, build up a set of uh, things to be responsive to, which are actually going to be useful to you. So what what was missing from the from the grandmother cell notion is the idea that you, if you are going to have things as selective as that, there better be things that occur frequently and that are significant in the life of the animal. Mm. And if you if you incorporate those two things, then grandmother cells are fine. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I plan to <coughs> write another update of on yeah, this point. I, 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 I read it in the fairly recent time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, is there any questions? Yeah. Oh, maybe he wants to take some other photos in yeah. Yeah. other situations. Here, uh, Outside. <coughs> or elsewhere in the house? Do um, you have any location or Sometimes for walking or. Oh, yeah. yeah. I yeah. think it's something that rep represents your would life. You, life would yeah. you like me to, to exercise the dog? That's <laughs> <laughs> fine. <coughs> uh, you know, Horace, thank you very much for this yeah, very yeah. interesting yeah. talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Well, good. I, it has taught a lot about me. Good. Uh, Especially the relationship between mindset learning and statistical yeah. learning. I, I think it's certainly a very in, important, fascinating. Yeah. Oh, don't forget to. Your... Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> are, are you using old fashioned?
film. Yes. Yeah. This is a film. Film. Yes. Film.